Thanks for joining us today. We're in a series called The Blessed Life, and we're learning how to tap into God's resources so that we can be a channel, a river, to release His resources to our homes, to our families, to our communities, and to the world. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at hftwchurch.org. Or if you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so at hftwchurch.org forward slash give. God bless you and your family. I hope that you discover how amazing God is and what he wants to give to you and through you to reach the world. Well, I'm so excited to share God's word with you. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4 today. This is the last of our teachings on the blessed life. And today we're going to talk about unleashing your gifts to change the world, about the talents and the assignments that God wants to release. I uh, love this story Wayne Cordero told about being in Japan as a, a young man. He was on the beach and they were selling these little birds, these little finches. And he, he decided he wanted to buy one and he took it. He was going to take it home. It was just 10 yen. But they said, no, you don't take this home. This is just so you get the privilege of opening the cage and letting the bird out. He said, well, okay. And uh, he says, I'll never forget that bird was just so shy and so kind of cooped up. But when I took it to the edge over the cliffs of the, of the ocean, I, I remember I opened that cage and that little bird started to get revival. And uh, it moved to the edge of the, of the cage. And all of a sudden, it took off. In fact, he said it flew in a giant circle and it literally came back to him chirping. I don't know what he said, arigato, or something like that. And uh, he looked at that and he said, man, I see a picture of the body of Christ here. How many know there's someone and something in every Christian that often gets caged up? The someone is the Holy Spirit. Have you ever known how Christians can cage up the Holy Spirit and, and, and quench him sometimes? And the fact that he has these gifts. The Bible teaches us these amazing uh, spiritual gifts in, in faith and in mercy, evangelism, healing, tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, giving, administration, mercy, some 21 of them. And they're not just talents. We may have natural abilities to teach, but the gifts of the Spirit or when God comes up on and through what we can do. How many know we don't have the ability to change anybody's life? I can talk, but my teaching can inform you, but only the Holy Spirit can transform you. <laughs> and, and the gifts of the Spirit may be us doing something, but they are when the Spirit comes. I love that picture of the woodpeckers kind of poking on the tree, and all of a sudden a lightning bolt comes from heaven, <laughs> zaps the tree above him, and... The woodpecker says, wow, I'm awesome. <laughs> but it's when God comes and he takes these things inside of us. And he says, I want you to release this now. And when you do, it'll change the world. When you release this gift, this little word, you know, we saw that when Charles gave the prophecy. And, and you know, there were people that accepted Jesus just now. I don't know if you know that. There was, there was a touch because when the Spirit is given permission, He changes the world. And the problem is, so much of the time, that gets bottled up. How many know that the devil wants to keep you burying your talents? He wants to cage up your gifts. He wants you to be only one quarter alive in the Holy Spirit. Because if the church ever gets unleashed, watch out. <laughs> the gates of hell. But God wants to get the gold that's in you. And I remember the, the prospector who came to church and he looked out there at the church one day and he said, there's gold in them their pews, you know. He said, in those people out there, there's the gold that could change a city. But how many know you can have gold, but the gold has to get mined? It has to come out. And what I want to declare to you today, I don't know what you're going to do with your life, but I'll guarantee you one thing. The greatest joy you will ever feel here and in eternity is the joy of using your gifts 
to serve people in a way that their life is changed forever. In a way that they are touched by the presence of God. There's no joy like that. I remember just as a very young man, and God called me to preach, even though I didn't think I could do it. And I got invited at McKelligan's Canyon to give a talk where there was a concert. And I worked all week to think of something to say, and I was getting ready to walk up there. And, and the Lord said, forget everything you've prepared. I'll tell you what to say when you get up there. Of course, I said, you're kidding, aren't you? And I got up there. And then all of a sudden, a word just popped in my mind. And I just remember feeling the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, there were over 100 people coming and crying. And I said, God, I can't believe you let that come through me. Now that's a picture, and what we're going to see in this verse, I'll get to it eventually, but what we're going to see is some God mainly uses through your words, and some may, mainly he uses through your hands or your works. I don't know how many people would say, I'm a word person, a teacher, a prophet, and how many of you would say, no, mostly I'm a person who serves, but God's spirit will flow through you. I, I'll give you an example of my wife, Sharon. So one day, we have this neighbor. And uh, he's a grouchy old guy. He literally, he catches our cat and turns it into the pound. I mean, that was like a spiritual bondage to share it. Don't you mess with my cat. But as she was trying to deal with that, the Lord helped her forgive. And the Lord told her to give the gift of brownies to this guy. How many know God can anoint cooking brownies? And her gift is the gift of hospitality. Her anointing is with her hands. She made these brownies, and I promise she didn't put poison in them or anything. She made these brownies, and she gave them. And when she gave them, she said, Mr. Bob, I'm sorry about the cat. She says, I just came to give these to you in Jesus' name. Big old tears came in his eyes. You know, very next day, he invited us over. I, I came over, and I got to lead. Uh, Mr. Bob to the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but it was a gift of the Spirit through brownies. <laughs> and there's a gift. Maybe it will come through music. Maybe it will come through writing, organizing, whatever it is. But it's the Spirit. And He wants to get released from your life. So let's read 1 Peter 4, 7. If we could. Verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. Isn't that a great verse? Just love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's a spiritual gift. Now listen to this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. To serve others. Can you say serve others? As faithful stewards or managers of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, here's the word people, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, there's the hands people, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Can you finish this sentence with me? To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Notice he says, God has given each of you gifts. Brother, sister, you have a gift. <laughs> you have a gift. A gift from heaven. Each of you. And in the Living Bible it says, now learn to manage and release those so God's generosity can flow through you. We've been talking about the blessed life. And the point I want to make today is, is God's grace flows when we serve others. When we are willing to take the focus off of us and we just become a person who looks and seeks for ways just to serve people. To say, how can I be a blessing to someone else? Because the moment we get our eyes off of ourselves and we begin to give, then God begins to fill us with supernatural gifts to give. 
Many people take the attitude, God, if you'll let me discover my gift, I'll start to serve. And God says, no, 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 no. If you'll start to serve, you'll discover your gift. If you'll take up the towel, you'll find your treasure. No, I want my gift and my resume and my title and my position. Sorry, wrong kingdom. (laughs) Take up your towel, your washcloth. Find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. Find a sorrow and mend it. Find an opportunity and seize it. Find a mess and clean it. (laughs) Find a blessing in your life and then give it to someone else. That's called the ministry, all right? Did you know you're in the ministry? (laughs) And if you will focus your life this way, as you're doing this, a release will come. Supernatural ways that you can't imagine God will turn your seeds into souls. He'll turn a hospital visit into heaven coming into a life. He'll turn a discussion into a deliverance, a teaching into a disciple. He'll do things you could never have imagined simply because you let the Spirit out. You let Him give. Now, Peter gives us some incredible truths. Verse 7, he says, This is why... You need to use your gift to serve others. Number one, because the end of all things is near. Very simply, he's saying, you're going to be in heaven sooner than you think. (laughs) And here's the point. What you will see up there determines how you served down here. You see, the way into heaven, we get into heaven by trusting God. Jesus, forgive me. But we get rewarded in heaven by how Jesus can trust us. Were you faithful with the little, then I will make you ruler over the much. How many know there's a lot of people that are going to get into heaven, but they're not going to be very rewarded in heaven? Heard about this really rich lady, but when she got up there, she was surprised because they led her to her shack. She was expecting a mansion and the angel said, what do you expect? This is all that you sent up here. This is all we could afford to build. <laughs> yeah. but, but many of us have said, well, we got into heaven. But God says forever, your reward. And what's a reward? I don't know. But I know that all of us will be filled with God. But some of us will contain more because we'll be bigger containers. One may be a thimble and one may be a swimming pool. But how you enjoy eternity all has to do with how you serve Jesus here. And Peter tells us the same thing that Jesus said. He says, folks, it's harvest time. All hands on deck. Work while it is day because the night is coming and no one will be able to work. Sow the seed while you have the chance. And understand this, that even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you will create a reward in heaven. Even the littlest thing is the biggest thing. You see, what I know about us, we're probably none of us going to win an Oscar. You saw the Oscars the other night. We're probably not going to win a Pulitzer Prize, Emmy, Academy Award, whatever it is. But every one of us can win something a million times greater. An eternity in which God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You served in this little way, now come and rule over my kingdoms forever. And one thing I know is that those who will be greatest up there are not even hardly noticed here. The first shall be last, the Bible says. Because down here, people are known by how they're known by people. Up there, you're known by how you're known by God. (laughs) God sees the simplest way that you serve. And it's not about the stage. It's about your obedience. When I first went to the Philippines, my first mission trip, a lady named Mary Holloway, elderly lady who, be, who was homebound. Church was when I visited her house. I'll never forget, she forced me to take half of some of her, most of her Social Security check 
to give to the people in the Philippines. And then she says, Dale, I will pray for you every day for the rest of my life. You know, she ended up praying for me for almost 30 years. And when I went there, the Lord says, Dale, this is going to make a big impression. I just want you to know, lots of stuff is going to happen from you going over there. But I just want you to know, Mary's going to get the big trophy for this. <laughs> what, you, who, what nobody sees is what matters to me the most. The second thing he, he says is just love covers a multitude of sins. He says you need to serve because, because the more you serve, the more love will flow. How many know a loving, a serving family is a loving family? A serving church is a love. Where, where people are around serving, the temperature of that place, it overflows with kindness. It overflows with ge generosity and graciousness. And I love how he says, it covers a multitude of sins. See, we as the church have a lot of flaws, don't we? We have a lot of faults. We need something to cover our reputation in the community, right? It's kind of like when I, as a husband, you say a really stupid thing to your wife. Flowers really helps. Covers a multitude of things. But anyhow, when we come to the world, most of the world doesn't have a great attitude towards the church. In a recent survey, 49% of non-church going people said they couldn't think of one positive contribution the church had made to their community. Now that's sad. But what Jesus wants to know is you're not going to convince the world by preaching more sermons. But if you want to be great, and you know what great means? It means if you want to have influence, that's what greatness is, then serve. Go serve the people out there. They're not going to be won by your words, but they'll, they'll be touched by letting your light so shine and they see your good works. Part of our plan is we've been contacting these schools and one school's inviting us to come and clean the bathrooms in Jesus' name. <laughs> Who's volunteer? Anyhow, I'll tell you what, we'll gain. People will say, well, maybe those Christians aren't so bad. They'll, they'll see by our works we shall be known. If we just serve this community, the Bible says when you serve, the grace of God goes in its manifold power. Light invades the darkness. The kingdom comes just when you serve in his name. Changes the equilibrium of the spiritual atmosphere. It changes hearts. One early Sunday morning, I, I was going to come to church like super early, 4 o'clock, something like that, and prepare a little bit. And there was a car broke down, and I knew these people had been at the bar all night, and they were stuck, and they were and a husband and their wife. And I just felt led to pick them up, and they wanted to go all the way to El Paso, downtown. I said, okay, I'll serve you. And as we went, I remember I... I, I got in a conversation. I just asked him, well, what do you think of church? And one of them said, well, this is what I know. I will never trust a pastor. Every pastor I've ever met is a crook. I said, okay. <laughs> Moving on. And then I just kept asking about their life. And, of course, eventually I asked them what they do for a living. And, of course, you know how that went. They turned around and said, well, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I'm a pastor. It was quiet. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe not all pastors. <laughs> and I said, you know, pastors are pretty messed up, but we have a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And you'll forgive all of us, but we're so grateful he changed us. He could change you too. You know, they ended up letting me pray for him just because I took him to, to their house. You know, it's just the kindness of God that leads men to repentance, the Bible says. It's the kindness of God demonstrated through simple gifts, going to a hospital, giving someone some groceries, caring for somebody who needs cheering up. We unleash our gifts by, first and foremost, just taking on the role of a servant. That's what he says. Serve. 
Serve, just be a servant. Jesus taught his disciples this. Their idea of being great was if you work hard enough, eventually you don't have to serve anybody. You can get other people to do the dirty work. So one day, in his last night with them, they're all boasting about how great they are. In the meantime, they have smelly feet. <laughs> how many know ministry is not very complicated? It's just what's the next need. Jesus lays aside his robe and takes a towel and a water basin and he just starts washing feet. In verse 12, if we could just see it uh, in uh, John 13, 12. I just love this verse. When he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on and returned to his place and said, Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. He said, you know you have a lot of gifts, but do you know why you have gifts? It's not so you can be the most famous, cool person. The highest purpose of gifts is simply to add value to another human being. It's not to make you look good. It's to make Jesus look good and big in the eyes of people because how, how you cared about the simple need that they had. Because see, when you become a person who says, I'm okay with being a servant, then God says, I'm okay trusting you as a steward. I like to say what God wants us to be is like mail carriers or people for you who work for UPS. You know, God has some awesome packages up there today. But they're only servants that say, God, what gift do you want to deliver to my family? God, I'm not going home thinking, what, what can I get today? What do I want? But I'm someone who says, God, I choose to let my life be about serving. And, and God, if you have any packages for me to deliver, I'll deliver them. And I'm not going to wait for a handshake. You know, people don't get that excited about the mailman. He's just the deliverer. Or she's just the deliverer. What they're excited about is, God, I want them to be excited about you. I, I'm ready. And you know, the moment you begin to serve in the natural, you get to see God do the supernatural. It's the natural thing that opens the door for the supernatural thing. You go to the hospital just to sit with someone, and all of a sudden, healing comes in the room because you were doing the natural. You know what I found out where the power of God is? It's in the place that people are hurting the most. The power is in the pit, I like to say it. Go find the pit, you'll find the power. Go find the most hurting place in the city of Las Cruces. Step in there in Jesus' name. Show God's love, and the power of the Holy Spirit will come. That's where Jesus went. And you know what? Jesus is still going the same places he went 2,000 years ago, where people are hurting the most, and they have nobody to care. And the moment you get there, Jesus will show up in crazy ways. Another time I was talking to a hitchhiker. You know, I like hitchhikers. It's captive audience. But this other time, they were just on the side of the road. And I just, they were going to California. I wasn't going that far. But I just gave them some food. And they weren't interested in the gospel at all. But I just encouraged this guy. He said, I've been here eight hours. Nobody picked me up. And I just tried to encourage him and give him something to eat. And I said, can I pray for you? Okay, you can pray for me. And then all of a sudden the Lord says, just tell him that the second car that comes is going to pick him up and then he'll know that I love him. Before I knew what I said, I said, there's going to a car come that's going to pass and then the next car that comes is going to stop. And when he comes, I want you, you to remember how much Jesus loves you. I said, what did I just say? <laughs> but sure enough, that second car came. And he looked up and, whoa. <laughs> But you see, because of the natural, I could do the supernatural. The power flows when people are serving. The other thing he says about this is we've got to serve 
as an act of worship to God. Mother Teresa said the key is, is not what you give, but how much love that you show when you give. That's where the gift gets released. And I have to brag about my wife Sharon again. So many people have said when they come in that door down there, they won't come into this building until they see her because of her smile. Two little kids have come up to her recently, reached up and said, Miss Sharon, can I call you Grammy? (laughs) And who knows how if you hold a little kid, you may be holding the next Billy Graham. And it's not because it takes a lot of intelligence or gifting to open a door. But it takes a great amount of love to change a life. Anything that's done in the love of Christ. See, the Bible says faith works through love. Wherever love is, supernatural faith comes into that. The other side of that is to serve as it said there, so beautiful. Two things it said. Make sure you serve with hospitality. Don't complain about it. There's the love part. How many know God doesn't anoint complaining? <laughs> you just lost your anointing the moment you complain. But number two, he says, whatever you do, do it so that Jesus Christ can get the glory. To him belongs the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do it as an act of worship is what he's saying. See, it's not what you do, it's who you do it for. doesn't really matter if it's big, if it's small, but who you do it for matters completely. Howard Hendricks was telling, he was on an airplane, he got stranded for four hours, everybody was so grumpy, complaining, but he couldn't help but notice the stewardess was just so gracious and kind and helped everybody, gave them snacks. Afterwards, he said, please, can I have your name? I want to write your supervisor and tell him you're unbelievable. You're fantastic. And he said, how did you keep your cool? How did you you smile? And She said, oh, this morning, my husband do this. We do this every morning. We get up and we ask God, please, God, make me a good representative of Jesus Christ today. I work for Jesus here in the airlines. I don't ever work for the airlines. The power of the Spirit was unleashed through her life. Then let your service come in dependence upon God giving through you. He says in verse 11, if you're going to speak, dare to lean into God in a way that you believe that it's God speaking through you. And if you're going to serve, serve with the strength that God provides I looked up Greek word there for provide, and it says, serve with the strength that God, literally it says, lavishes upon you. That when you begin to serve in Jesus' name, there is a God who is pouring into you his anointing. Tap into that. So many times, if you're like me, we can just serve out of our own history, our own ability. Okay, here I go again, I'm serving, I'm doing this. And again, what happens? There's no eternal results to that. We did a good job, but the kingdom didn't come. Because it's not what we can do. It's what he does through us. It's the anointing. Can I tell you that again? And I often say it's like a pen, you know. A pen was made to write, but a pen by itself Pen, get it together. Do something. It's just kind of lame. But when the hand comes on the pen, how many need the hand of Jesus on your life? God, would you put your hand on me today? I got a meeting to go to. I need the Holy Ghost. I need the hand of God on this thing I'm doing. Disciples, when they preached in the book of Acts, Peter looked at this man by the gate and the man said, can you give me some money? And he said, silver and gold have I none. But then he said, interesting, he says, in this pocket, there's nothing. But I got another pocket right up here. Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. (laughs) I've got the power of God. 
His presence is with us. If, if I could just lean into you, Holy Spirit, if I could just be filled with you, Holy Spirit, if I could just do the very next thing, not by might nor by power, but by thy spirit, Lord, heaven will come. However small it is. And then lastly, he says, offer your gifts to be used as a part of the body. One of the things you'll find about gifts, God doesn't mean for gifts to operate independently on their own. Every time the Bible describes gifts, it describes parts of the body. It says the ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you, eye. We're going to have the fellowship of ears today. The foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you today. Because every gift is intrinsically connected to every other gift. When God gives you a gift, that gift is awesome, but it's never going to be what it can be until it's a part of a team called the body of Christ, the local church. It's in the dynamic synergy of us submitting that gift Sometimes people have a hard time. I, I've got my gift. I don't want to put my gift on the table. It's my gift, and I'm going to use it where I want to use it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you can say, I want this gift, because if, if the hip bone's connected to the knee bone and the knee bone's, you know, if I can connect this to other people with other gifts, then the body becomes released to be what Jesus called us, the hope of the world. Many churches are operating with half of their body. This half is nothing. This half is trying to do all the work. <laughs> They're not operating on all eight cylinders. And yet what happens when the body of Christ finally says, I know if I'm going to find my dream, I got to find my team. I got to, I got to connect. I got to submit this and say, how does this fit? You see, every one of us preaches the gospel, but we do it in a little different way. But when we put all the little ways together, we are unbelievable. You see, some of you preach the gospel best, maybe by playing the drums. That's the best gift you. Have. Some of you. By welcoming people. Some preach the gospel by taking care of babies in the nursery. How many know that's an anointing? And one lady, I remember her testimony, a single mom, and she said, I came here and my baby would not stay, but the babysitter was so kind. And, and because my baby stayed, I got to hear the message. When I heard the message, I got saved. How many know the nursery worker was preaching the gospel? Some preach by follow-up. Some preach by going to the hospital. Some preach by preparing meal. Right now, that kitchen team is going crazy. They, they just feed those kids and they just, we can't hardly get rid of them. They're having so much fun. But when they do that, a kid is full. The kid can hear the message and the kid can accept the Lord and know the Lord. And last Easter, can you imagine, last Easter weekend, we had 96 people make a profession of faith to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, that didn't happen because of the preacher. That happened because hundreds of people said, I can do something. I can give one of those plastic eggs with candy and an invitation at Walmart. I can go and pray and intercede for people to come. I can serve as an usher. I can bless people when they get here. I can have snacks for husband. And because we were a team, we saw the dream. And this year, we just see that vision. I'm praying for 150 people to walk through the line of faith and be saved. And you know how it's going to happen? It's going to be because we are a team, because people said, I could do this and I can do that. And we can use our little gifts and make them this glorious, lean, mean, fighting machine <laughs> for Jesus Christ. All of it for His glory. As we close, I want to challenge you. If you happen to be one of those people 
who can relate to the whole thing of, of the cage and the bird. And you can say, you know, I think there's gifts inside of me that have never come out. I, I just know that I have not let the Holy Spirit out of me the way he wants to be let out of me. I just know that. I just know that there's assignments in me. The Lord told me this year, I'm going to talk about next week. The Lord told me that this church is going to start 70 new ministries. Not me, you. All around this area and other cities. The Spirit is just going to come on people and say, set apart John for the work of ministry. Set apart Mary because she's supposed to go over there and win that apartment complex to Jesus Christ. Set apart him because he's supposed to gather food and he knows how to organize. Set apart them and the Spirit is going to fall on this church because people are saying yes to the gifts of God operating through their life. Can I get a few more amens? <laughs> okay. Don't want you to miss a great opportunity to say that. But the Spirit is saying this is the year that the church moves from being an audience to the army of God moves from just people who are passengers on a ship to people who are members of the crew people who pick up the paddle and say let's see how fast we can go together let's see how many lives we can change together for many of you those things though are trapped there's something you would recognize i in your life maybe you've been discouraged maybe you've been hurt maybe you've been so disengaged maybe your spirit is sort of dull paul said to timothy one time timothy stir up the gift inside of you it's like it's like embers and coals that are just about dead but it's inside of you right now a faith that could move mountains. A message that could bring hundreds to Christ. A healing gift. A wisdom gift. Insight. Administration. It's in you now, but you've got to stir it up. Don't let the fire die. You'll regret it forever. Begin to say, Holy Spirit, here's my heart. Here's my hands. I'm available. I have found the anointing of God. God doesn't anoint the qualified. He qualifies those willing to be available. Who are willing. You know that favorite picture I have of Shrek and the donkey. Pick me, pick me, you know. When I see an attitude like that in a Christian, pick me! I said, I don't care what their education is. I don't care how talented they are. They will be the ones that will turn a world upside down for Jesus Christ. They have the heart. They are like David, a man or woman, after God's heart. I want to ask you if you want to be that way. If you would say, God, I want to stir that up. Maybe I need something broken off my life. Maybe I need healing. Maybe I need to just let the shame of what I've done just be gone so that the gifts of God can come out of me. And as we close, some of you might like to get prayer for that, for the Spirit to release you. This release comes first by accepting His salvation. You have to have His life in you before His life can flow through you. And then it comes, as the Bible says, if you're willing to present your body to God as a living sacrifice. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer?